Well, let's start with the aerial view, Matt. Uh, can you just talk to us about what an employee ownership center is in uh, just in a, in general terms? Um, yeah, yeah. So the kind of employee ownership center model has been around since the 80s, um, with Ohio really being the first one um, that came out of uh, uh, a lot of the kind of deindustrialization um activities and attempts to sort of delay the closing of steel plants in Ohio and Western Pennsylvania and things like that. Um, so kind of coming out of that experience, there's kind of a, a shift in focus towards, you know, ownership succession of healthy businesses versus the kind of rescue strategy of, you know, businesses in declining industries. Mm. Uh, and so the Vermont Employee Ownership Center was formed, um, drawing on many of the lessons of the Ohio Employee Ownership Center and mentored by John Logue back in 2001. So we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of its existence. Um, and kind of it has had a couple of shifts. So the Ohio Employee Ownership Center was um, in, and still is associated with Kent State University, um, whereas we were formed as a, a independent nonprofit. And the, the founding group was uh, kind of a mixture of folks from ESOP companies, folks from some of the worker co-ops in Vermont, economic development people, um, including someone who had worked um, uh, in Bernie's, uh, in Bernie's as the head of his economic development um, office when he was mayor of the city of Burlington. Um, and so, so there's this kind of like interesting mix of folks who came together to form the organization. Um, and over the years, it's kind of been gone up and down. There's some, some, some kind of federal funding early on to help stand it up. And then, um, and to, to capitalize a little loan fund that we have. Uh, but kind of our main activities are really sort of, there's three kind of threefold strategies, right? One is um, we do a lot of just educational outreach around what, what is employee ownership? How does it work? You know, how does it work as an ownership succession strategy? Um, so seminars, conference, all that stuff. Um, once we find businesses that are interested in going employee owned, then, you know, then it's, more one-on-one -on -one kind of work with business owner, work with a um, group of employees to sort of explore the feasibility of, of doing that, um, exploring which models might work best. So we work with, we define employee ownership as um, that, that we work with as broad based. So in something where all full-time equivalent employees have a path to becoming co-owners of the business. So we don't work with ownership succession, succession situations where it's like they want to sell to one manager or a few key employees or things like that. It needs to be a structure that allows for broad-based ownership. So that looks like worker co-ops, that looks like ESOPs, and some discussion recently about um, uh, the use of purpose trusts, employee ownership trusts, that sort of thing. And then there's a, always like a handful of businesses that kind of have a, you know, kind of bespoke DIY model. Um, and in, one interesting one in Vermont is called a Chroma Technology, um, which kind of has its own approach to it, uh, which is fairly interesting. Um, but sort of the goal is to create and foster employee ownership in the state. So you know, really trying to get build a pipeline of, of folks interested in exiting to employee ownership. Um, and then once they've done so, providing kind of support and educational opportunities to the community of employee owned companies. So mm -hmm. again, we have kind of tracks in our conference for existing worker co-ops, existing ESOPs. Um, we've kind of convened, helped convene and organize a few groups, you know, there's a little worker co-op group in the state. Um, there's a, a group called the Employee Owners of Vermont, which does a lot of cross-company thing, uh, activities, started out as primarily kind of volunteerism, um, but is now kind of branching into peer groups and things like that. So, you know, that's, that's the kind of quick fire hose of, you know, what <laughs> the EOC is, where it came from, and kind of some of the key activities that we do. Nice. What's the, what's the mix of ESOPs versus worker co-ops that you have worked with? Um, so we tend to be more hands-on with the worker co-ops because there isn't as much of a developed professional infrastructure. Um, but really it's oftentimes a size, you know, size thing. Um, so there's some, there's some folks who are interested in going worker co-op on the larger end. And certainly we encourage that. Um, but generally, if we're talking about a company that's like more than, say, 50 employees, it tends to go go the ESOP route. Um, and so for the ESOPs, where you know there's lawyers and it's a very technical process, there's lawyers and trustees and other things like that that 
more or less once we've done the initial round of education that they're kind of handed off to and they, you know, and then, and then we see them again kind of at the end of the process. Um, for worker co-ops, it sometimes can be a little bit more um, high touch where, um, you know, you, you need the employees involved, the employees need to decide, yes, this is something we wanted to do. Um, so we'll oftentimes kind of work with the employee group to talk to capital providers, you know, work through potential bylaws, mm-hmm. um, you know, do, you know, figure out educational resources um, that can kind of help help build the both business literacy and, um, and just general kind of collaborative skills of the, of the future, hopefully um, worker owners. Um, and so, so that's something that's kind of off and on that we're sort of engaged with usually with at least a few serious prospects um, and that kind of work. Cool. How many uh, companies have you worked for, worked with in your almost 20 years now? Well, so I've been at it for six, for six years, but over the course of the, the whole, um, uh, the whole uh, trajectory, right? So we're talking, we're talking probably, probably four or 500 at one level or another. So we wow. kind of have you sort of think of it as a sales funnel in a little bit, right? Where you're like, okay, so there's a lot of folks that we have an initial conversation with, like someone who's like just turned 60 and is starting to think about retiring and is exploring their options. And we'll hop on, you know, half hour phone call and pretty quickly be like, oh, this is a bed and breakfast where it really just needs a single owner op- operator because you have two part-time people who definitely have no, <laughs> no interest in doing this, right? So there's a lot of that kind of initial screening work. Um, and then for folks for whom once you screen it then it's like, okay, no, there's, there's definitely a possibility here. Um, then you kind of go down a little bit of a deeper, um, deeper dive. Generally the kind of uh, the next step for a business owner who's interested before kind of bringing it to the employees is to do some level of valuation of the business. So that you have a sense of mm-hmm. what the actual, yeah, what, what a reasonable price would be and to do a little bit of modeling to say, okay, this is how much, you know, how much debt this could take on. This is how much like you would need to sell or finance to make it work. You know, here's the other possible sources of capital to finance this, you know, because very little is usually comes from the, comes from the employee group. Um, and so, so there's that kind of that process. And then once it's like, okay, there's, this seems like it's workable given the, given the profitability of the company and the willingness to sell or finance a certain portion and all of that. Um, then, then it's really kind of bring it to the employees kind of as a, you know, okay, this is how the model works. This is sort of how, you know, an initial swing at valuation and modeling kind of what the next few years would look like and how it would impact you, you kind of as individual workers, like, is this of interest? Um, are there folks who are willing to kind of, you know, put a little bit of time and headspace into, into moving this forward? So yeah, that's the kind of, you know, the generally the process there. So, and at each step, right, you know, you have the initial screening and then you have the kind of interest and then you have the serious interest where you're assessing feasibility. At each step you have, you know, kind of fewer folks reach that. Fewer and fewer, sure, that makes sense. Um, and so once you reach that stage of really being serious and wanting to go ahead, um, how many of those do you have going on at any given moment? Um, in terms of kind of like active cases, I'd say, you know, they're, they're feeling, again, it sort of depends on how serious, how sort of soon. I'd say it's probably like at any given time, we maybe have like half a dozen that are like the real live ones where it's like, okay, we're, we're sort of in, in the mix. All right, next step. So let's see that. And then maybe like, I don't know, there's then a concentric circle of like maybe, maybe, you know, eight, 18 to 24 that are, um, that are in the, you know, interested, but not, um, not kind of like, you know, rolling right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, and then the, the other thing is really to, to just be, be aware of because it's connected to this ownership succession piece is that oftentimes it's very much a long game. So, mm-hmm. you know, well, the ones that we do see flip might've talked to the, our founder, Don, like 10 years ago for the first time and then got busy and sort of like dipped off the radar for like five years and then showed up to one of our ownership succession seminars for a refresher and then disappeared again for two years. We send them pokes every, every six months. And then eventually there's some catalyst that says, okay, I'm really ready to do this now. Um, and then that sort of like long-term kind of continuous contact means that we're one of the folks that when they're really ready to roll, they already know who we are. They already have some baseline understanding. So that kind of a long-term piece of the strategy, I think, is 
imp an important one to sort of be aware of um, that, you, that you start to use that it's a big existential decision to stop owning a business for a lot of people because that just is so much of their life. And right. so it's, so oftentimes it's, it's not something that can really be pushed within a particular time frame. It's kind of when they're ready when they're or ready. they're like, Oh shoot, I just, <clears throat> my wife just had a stroke and suddenly mortality is really salient for me right now. And therefore I should yeah. actually start making moves that, you know, reflect that reality, things like that. Cool. Um, can you talk about your um, your internal uh, org chart and your your staff? Yeah, you, yeah. So we are very small. Yep. So basically, we're two full time equivalents in the about, and there's three of us. Well, kind of four right now. But um, so I'm executive director. I work 35 hours a week. Um, our the sort of found the sort of founding executive director. Um, now works just 20 hours a week as program director and he's kind of uh, Don. Uh, so it's, he, he also has like a second second life as a musical composer and oh, is cool. in his 60s and I think is kind of, you know, is in the sort of like, all right, I just kind of want to work half time and we'll probably continue doing that for another few years, but it's kind of, you know, slowly stepping back. Um, That's interesting. It's very rare to hear somebody actually step down from being ED and yet stay in the organization. I mean, he's, he, he's done it before too. <laughs> there was a <laughs> time like five or 10 years ago where, you know, I think it, yeah. So, so he's, he's pretty happy. I think pretty happy with, with that level of involvement. Um, cool. And then we have someone who's also kind of per, sort of late, fairly late career um, who had been working for us 20 hours a week and decided she wanted to step down to 10 as of this year. Um, it does, uh, does, Kind of like a lot of the one-on-one -on -one outreach and she's a former legislator so she also kind of keeps keeps track of policy stuff um nice. and that's good you know, when, when we because we get about half of our funding from from the state um economic development uh kind of keeping keeping an eye on that process and and you know the relationship we have with with the um, agency of commerce and community development um nice. and then we had an intern last summer who we've kind of kept on um, for the year as like a 10 hour a week kind of uh, communications person uh, who's gonna be with us until May when she graduates her senior year and starts starts her first, you know, post postgraduate job. She already has lined up. So we're a little sad we'll lose her then, but she's been she's been good. So cool. so yeah, so it's pretty pretty small, pretty lean. Um, you know, we have a good board of directors that again kind of make reflects a mix of the different constituency groups that we work with and um, um, yeah yeah so um, cool. and I think it's the sort of thing where in the next th three or four years um, you know kind of thinking of a transition it might might transition from having you know a couple of part-time staff to one to maybe two more full-time people when when Don is ready to fully retire or something but for the moment we're in a pretty comfortable position I think hmm. interesting um, so let's talk more about your revenue model. On the website, you have lots of sponsors. And mm -hmm. but then you said you also get about half your money from the state. Yeah, yeah. So our two big kind of sources of revenue are one is a grant from the State Agency of Commerce and Community Development, which is connected to us doing this ownership succession work. Um, and then the other major thing is connected to our conference. So we do a conference every year, you know, um, this this last year it was online, of course, but um, usually usually in person at the University of Vermont um, that we get about, you know, usually 200 to 250 attendees. Um, lot, and it's a good opportunity where we have kind of a mix of people from um, the, uh, the employee ownership, the existing employee owned companies, and then a track for people who are exploring employee ownership. And so there's really good, op op good, Kind of opportunities for the exploring people to meet people who are doing it day to day, which takes it from the like, that's a cool idea. I wonder if it would work in my company to, mm -hmm. oh, I've met a bunch of people where it's working at their company. And therefore, you know, we, we tend to sort of see that as, you know, we have, it's a one day, one day thing gets them kind of revved up and gets them sort of necessary relationships and all of that. And then so usually after the conference, we see, we see our probably biggest spurt of people who are like, okay, I'm ready to, to take, take it the next step now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for our conference between registrations and then sponsorship from employee-owned companies and service providers and other other partners, that's kind of maybe like forty percent of our revenue, and then the last ten percent's like, you know, 
one-off grants or a little bit of fee-for-service income if we're doing really um, more like high-touch technical assistance work with a with a converting company or things like that, but all kind of relatively minor. Interesting. Okay, this is useful stuff here for us. Um, so you said at the outset that you're more or less modeled after the Ohio EOC. Um, yep. Did you... Uh, I don't know if you were around for the founding of the I was Vermont not, EOC. I was probably middle oh, okay. school or early high school. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you might not be able to answer uh, the question of why the Vermont EOC is not housed inside of a university the way Ohio is. So you know that? that was actually some, some level of recommendation from the Ohio folks was that they're kind of, and there was a period of time when it was kind of considered to house it at UVM. Um, but I think the decision ultimately to, to go for more of an independent nonprofit was a connected to sort of like some, some revenue stuff, right. Where being connected to university means the university is going to take, take a you know, nice chunk of whatever, whatever sort of funding that you do get. Um, and then I think also there's some kind of like other, other bits of flexibility that, um, that, sort of not being affiliated with the university of like not needing to deal with being sort of a little kind of side thing in the midst of the politics of, of a grand bureaucracy uh -huh. um, <laughs> versus being able to just kind of like focus energy on the organization itself. Um, so I think, I think that really, that sort of informed the decision. And so, so I think there was a period of time when it was quasi early on when it was quasi affiliated with UVM, like there was an office on the UVM campus, but it wasn't like officially a program of UVM and that was as close as it got. Okay, interesting. I mean, the other big differences I that I see is that Ohio does not have a board of directors, as best I can tell. So it's, right. it's a very it's a very different dynamic than what you've got. Different, yeah, um, yeah. Kind of, different I think the other thing with Ohio was, you know, it was kind of, its affiliation with Kent State was very much connected to, um, you know, it being created by and driven by John Logue, who is a who is a professor there, mm. um, and so he he died you know, a number of years ago. Um, but he was definitely kind of like, a, you know, a key, sort of a key player in that, in that sort of decision. And it was, I think, as, as a professor, it's kind of a natural thing to set it up, to set up a program at the university where right. he already worked. Right, right. Um, whereas we, we'd sort of like, you know, have a now a retired UVM professor on our board and all of that. But, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't like the sort of like organizational creation was was driven by someone or was driven from from like within a university where it's itself, right. Most important, I think. Um, going back just for a minute to the the sponsors um, what sort of uh, how do you cultivate a relationship with them and what sort of expectations do they have of you um, so it's really heavily connected to the conference and I'd say there's kind of two groups one is you know, and it's been growing over time as existing employee owned companies where really it's like they'll send, they'll usually send a group of employees to the conference or employee owners to the conference to, um, to go to the various kind of tracks and things like that. And then, you know, as a sponsor, they get a number of free tickets and discounts for the rest of that. So we definitely like have some companies where they'll be like, oh, we'll send 10 people. Or I think actually two years ago, we had one new, new company that sent like 30 people. Right. Wow. Um, so so there's that that piece, but I think with the companies, it's generally like, oh, the conference is a nice benefit, um, but we, and we also just generally want to support it. Um, and then there's kind of more like the service provider types, right? Law firms, financial institutions, that sort of thing, where you know at the conference we'll have opportunities for you know when it's in person, you know, the, them to do a tab like table and meet the folks at the who are coming there to think about it, right? And you're like, oh, I'm thinking about doing an ESOP and you know, therefore I can come to, you can come to the conference and meet like three different trustees and, you know, essentially like interview all of them um, and that sort of thing. So there's, there's some level of that kind of like, you know, sponsorship being an opportunity to, to do outreach at the, at the conference. And, you know, we had to be more creative about that this last year because we were doing everything online. Um, but we were, we were able to offer like little mini, mini, you know, essentially like table sessions that sponsors could, could, uh, could host to, to discuss a particular topic and things like that. So um, there's some some level of 
of um, you know for for them some level of kind of marketing marketing benefit for the ones who are who are service providers versus just um, employee owned companies for whom you know the, the conference is kind of the big annual convening of the broader employee ownership community that mm -hmm. a lot of them like to be part of. And these these sponsorships, I take it these are kind of long term long standing relationships that you've had. Um, particularly with the, the service providers, this is, this is mm -hmm. an ongoing yeah, thing. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like every year Don will, well, Don has a list and yeah, we, you can look back and see, and generally there's a lot that do it kind of year after year once they're sort of in. And are in they the, sponsoring both, both the conference and the, the EOC itself or is yeah, it kind of yeah. one so of the, the, the conference is the primary like kind of catalyst for it, but it's kind of a year. Um, it's a year of sponsorship type thing to say that you're sponsoring the organization. Oh, 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 oh,